Hello. Hello. Yes. Yes, Christian, welcome. Hey, hey Tuka. Uh, <laughs> I, can, I cannot see you, but could you see yeah. me? I can see you. We, okay. We're going to have you soon. Okay, so a very good morning to everyone. We are very glad uh, and we thank you for being here. Let's stay. It's like with the students, please, please. <laughs> yeah, familiar situation. So we have the last panel of our seminar uh, and um, we are very glad to present you. The uh, panelists out, uh, start uh, presenting each by each before they talk. Mm -hmm. So uh, Christian Guimers mm -hmm. is going uh, to start. He's the president of the Interdisciplinary Institute of Relations between Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean, IRELAC, and professor of international economics at the ICHEC, Brussels. His work research focuses on EU-Latin American relations, re uh, regional integration, and applied economic policy issues in both to EU and Latin America, especially on crisis management and economic policy coordination. He has also served as the coordinator to the previous Jean Monnet Network on Crisis, Equity, and Democracy. So we are very glad to have you, Christian, and we miss you in person, since I think it's the first seminar you are not attending. But okay, the floor is yours. Thank you. You have 15 minutes. Thanks a lot, uh, Tuka. Uh, I apologize for not being present, uh, as you know, and I am especially grateful to uh, Dimitris, uh, to uh, Tuka, and to Andrea for uh, making possible this uh, distance presentation because uh, they, uh, you, you, you uh, had this feeling, the important feeling that it's. Uh, essential to have a systemic view about all uh, the aspects of uh, environment and especially uh, global warming. Uh, a lot of uh, side effects or systemic effects are generally not considered. I think that in fact we are entering into a second stage of the denial, so the disavowal uh, now it's not so much to say that there is no global warming, it is now to say that all that could be easily solved. So I don't agree with that, although I support strongly the fact that market mechanisms are absolutely essential, but they are not enough for the reason that I explained here. So, uh, let me see. Ah, it is not. Okay, so these are the facts. The best way to present them is to see that there is a trend when you extract the natural phenomena of carbonization, you could see an exponential trend. Uh, so the synthesis of my argumentation is presented in a single slide. For making possible decarbonation, we need a sharp increase in investment from now. That means a reduction in consumption worldwide. Uh, emerging economy and developing economy needs very much capital inflows as this was packed uh, in the Paris Agreement. That means that advanced economy have to make possible outflows of uh, capital toward uh, the developing of the emerging. Is it possible with the present uh, functioning of the financial architecture? My answer is categorically no. And the essential reason is the so-called Triffin dilemma. They I already in previous session, they insisted very much on this. For me, it is a, a key aspect for understanding the global crisis. Because the problem is that the US economy absorbed global net savings. And uh, in order to make possible decarbonization, you could think, well, these are net, net flows, but what we need is growth flow. Could growth flow do it? 
No, because the same Trifend dilemma is also uh, a system of procyclical instability through the phenomena of global liquidity. I will explain what it means. So the fact is that uh, we are uh, observing an evolution with a relative scarcity of safe assets in dollar. And this is provoking for the mechanism I will explain a pro-cyclical fluctuation in the monetary base and in the global liquidity. And this creates especially damaging spillover on investment in emerging and developing economies. In that case, it is not possible to decarbonize at the rhythm which, is ne which would be necessary. And I will present also the only solution is to create a stable multilateral safe assets, which is now possible with an E as the R, that means uh, uh, using CBDCs. And so let's see uh, what we could develop uh, quickly. You could see that in the last two years, emerging and developing economy uh, didn't uh, invest enough in decarbonization. You could see that only the US and the other advanced are doing, are starting to do the job. So, an, a first problem is this amazing chart and data collected by the International Monetary Fund. We could see that at the world level, we are uh, subsidizing the use of fossil energy in cash for more than one trillion of dollars one trillion of dollars. And if we take on board the negative externalities for too cheap price for uh, fossil energy, uh, the, these externalities amount to an additional 7% of world GDP. For example, the EU uh, is um, spending 6.8% each year of its GDP in direct and indirect subsidies to fossil energy. This is a scandal, which has to be made much known. As far as I know, I am the only one to project this chart, which is still online uh, in the IMF database. For, for example, the second phase of denying is a best example, is the ECFIN, the European Commission, ECFIN uh, EQUEST model, which showed that at least Decarbonization will cost, if we adopt just clean subsidies, uh, one person of the consumption, one person on the accumulated uh, consumption from now to 2000, uh, 2015. This is totally irrealistic. Why? My uh, could be good and enough under the condition that there were no other price distortion on the market. And you could see that we have uh, three main uh, Oh, okay. Christian, we lost you. We're going to connect again. Uh, Chris, can you, you have no microphone, mic off. Your microphone is off. Still talking. He did. Το είναι δικό του το πρόβλημα το μικρόφωνο ή το γάρνο μες. Christian, you need to unmute. If you hear me, you need to unmute.
it, you cannot do from here to some side? No. Ah, yeah, it depends. As it tells them. Sometimes. All right. Now, is it okay? Yeah, now it's fine. Okay. I, I didn't touch anything, but I had a, a cut in the internet connection, apparently. So he, he, he switched off. So let me quickly uh, be back to what we were. Uh, the fact that we have uh, this explanation with a lot of uh, distortion. Uh, Chris, Christian, provoking... sorry, we cannot yes. see your presentation. Can you reshare it? Yeah. Yeah. Is it okay? So th this not distortion, uh, not yet. This distortion make impossible financial stability at global level. So. Now, Christian, what is the global Christian, liquidity? Can you hear me? Yeah. We cannot, we cannot see it yet. You don't see? Oh, we have to... Um, Be, be, since you are pressed for time, do you would you like us to to, to share it from here, and you can tell yes. when you like to to change no. the slides? Yes, if you could uh, make me the share, uh, but on my own screen, please do it because I am lost. Okay, okay. yeah, 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 no problem. Wait for a minute. Is it okay? Yes, just wait for a minute. We are uploading now. Yes, now we can yes. see you and the presentation, yeah. Okay, sorry for this. So I was trying to give you a, a concrete idea of what is global liquidity, which is so important. Global liquidity has nothing to do with the strict definition of monetary stock. It is, in fact, the source of funds available for all the private sector in the world. So it is an ability to, to access to cash and Fed for example, which is a leading role in monetary policy worldwide, cannot control fully. I give you some uh, figure that I try to evaluate. Global liquidity is around today 170 trillions of dollars, and this corresponds to a global monetary base by a factor uh, above one and below two, more or less. And you could see that presently, the, this global monetary base is 100, 100 trillions of dollars, among which you have uh, the central bank monetary base, stricto senso. It's not more than 25 trillions. You have the T-bills, which are tradable as safe assets, which is not so much. And uh, almost half is represented by uh, the rules and money market which are not controlled by central bank. So uh, you have this strict correlation between global liquidity and uh, all the markets in the world. You could see that on more than 50 years, there is a strict uh, correlation between global liquidity and long-term uh, business cycle. So in this, the US uh, role as the main international currency as a leading role. 
Mm -hmm. For a lot of reasons that they have now no time to discuss, but you could uh, share this PowerPoint, the last version, and uh, have a look to what means the Trifin Dilemma. It's not at all what it used to be in the past, and majority of literature is still back to the old definition, huh? to just the dollar trust. Then you add the explanation as the dollar uh, function of a world banker. This is not enough. You have also the Trifin built-in destabilizer, but now my explanation is the scarcity, the relative scarcity of dollar safe assets, which are much more necessary than it used to be in the past due to the need to use collaterals on the wholesale money market, the so-called shadow banks, which are now the majority of operation globally, are in, not in bank, but in the non-bank sector. And this provokes some kind of Gresham law inside uh, these uh, re repurchase market, uh, impulsing a pro-cyclical global monetary basis fluctuation with a multiplier, this creates a negative spillover on, on LDC. So the reason is uh, the kind of monopoly that uh, the best degree of moneyness is uh, only on the dollar safe asset and not the other. So once the business cycle turned down, you have a contraction of the monetary base uh, at the global level, because there is a discrimination, uh, operators, the dealers prefer uh, to have dollar safe assets as collateral and non-dollar uh, safe assets, even in Euro, uh, are second category of moneyness. And this provoke a reversibility in the global liquidity. You could see this clearly on this chart, in white, it is the global liquidity fluctuation, and in dark, it's only the U.S. safe asset. You could see that the non-U.S. safe assets in red uh, fluctuate much more than the black, uh, and that's the global liquidity. So they have a leading role creating this instability. And now it's explanation in uh, some uh, kind of caricature, uh, the global liquidity is the upper uh, yellow bar, and you could see that the, this reverse pyramid is rely upon a very uh, unstable basis uh, due to the fact that the market needs more safe assets than there are a possibility to issue uh, US liquid debt. No? So the monetary base in dollar plus the T-bills, T-notes, and bonds in dollar are insufficient. So when we have a return of, of liquidity condition, the red area is disappearing. So my thesis is that the only way to solve that is to do this, to have a multilateral uh, monetary base and a multilateral issue of safe asset through IMF, and in this case, you have no monopoly of moneyness except at the global level. And global level is not the depth of any uh, singular economy. In that case, it remains some cycle and some instability. It is a so-called Minsky moment due to the imperfection on financial markets because interest rate cannot, uh, is, is over-determined by demand and supply, it cannot, uh, balance the market normally. They are pro-cyclical by nature. And so, but you could reduce this phenomenon to the uh, normality and have a more or less stable. So I am sorry, but now I have to leave for urgent uh, um, clinic uh, meeting. You have a lot of uh, facts that could interest a, a lot of you. So sorry for that, I have to leave to run now. Thanks, uh, Dimitris, for this, and sorry for the technical inconvenience. Thank you, Christian. We are very, very wish you all the health and happiness and success. Thanks. And thank you and so much you for your enlightening presentation.
good. You could uh, diffuse this presentation to those who want or put it on, on the website. Thanks. Okay. Sorry for leaving Thank you. in the room. Okay. All the best from oh, everyone here. Thank you. So we we can discuss further, but now uh, Anastasia. Oh yeah. Uh, now I want to give the floor to Anastasia Kotlovskaya. She is the head of the division of financial markets and information technology at the Center for European Policy in Berlin, Germany. She has previously worked as a policy expert at the Policy Center for the Leibniz Institute for Financial Market Research in Frankfurt, uh, with a focus on digitalization of finance, sustainable finance, and capital market integration in the EU. She holds a PhD in law from the Goethe Institute, uh, not the Institute, the University. It's very different, right? Thank you. So thank you for the introduction and thank you, Dimitris, for this opportunity to speak today. Uh, the topic I would like to discuss today is the role of financial technology in the global financial system. Uh, so the broad spectrum of different innovative business models in the financial market can be unified under the term financial technology or shortly fintechs. And this uh, broad of technological innovation can influence um, uh, financial uh, sector significantly and have an impact on financial stability and resilience of a uh, financial system. Uh, due to uh, disruptive nature of fintechs, um, uh, there are many uh, aspects uh, that we can discuss. Uh, fintechs uh, can cause uh, many uh, changes, but also the opportunities for the whole financial system. Uh, in recent years, uh, fintech um, companies have essentially influenced the uh, financial industry, and the global financial crisis of 2008 was the main catalyzer and the main mi milestone in this uh, development. Uh, fintech companies uh, use uh, cutting-edge technologies, big data, data science, connectivity, and the change that traditional way of how financial transactions are made. Uh, and they also introduce uh, entirely new products uh, for financial markets that are now accessible uh, around the world. Uh, so, uh, as I said, the uh, global financial crisis of 2008 uh, was the beginning uh, of the development of a uh, first fintechs. Uh, and um, uh, the main reason for that was uh, that people uh, lost the trust of the banks uh, in the old format, and uh, this uh, resulted in the emergence of new uh, startups and uh, new business models they could uh, meet the needs of uh, customers better. Uh, also, the changes in the regulations of uh, the banking sector lead to uh, this development. Uh, uh, so, many banks uh, needed to increase their requirements for potential borrowers and uh, thus uh, the access to bank loans was restricted for some groups of customers. And it opened the way uh, for uh, new startups to occupy open niches on the financial market. Um, in addition, the financial crisis makes it more difficult for companies to raise capital uh, as banks restricted their uh, lending rules. Uh, so in this um, point, a crowd lending and crowdfunding platforms were a popular alternative for many bank customers um, who were unable to obtain uh, capital from traditional banks. Uh, so um, due to greater flexibility and the ability to apply new technologies. Many startups have been able to offer their customers better terms at uh, traditional uh, banks. Uh, but the scale of growth in lending a difference around the world. Uh, the higher the national income and the weaker the competition uh, is in the country, the more extensive is the activities of fintechs in those regions. Um, Moreover, lending in uh, think tanks is higher in places where banking regulation is less strict. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, fintechs also have impact on other um, areas of financial markets. And uh, another important area is wealth management space. Um, so um, now uh, fintechs can offer um, uh, robo-advisory uh, services that can um, uh, provide unbiased advice uh, in real time uh, that cost less than uh, uh, services of traditional uh, wealth management uh, services. Uh, so uh, fintech also opens new opportunities in the area of payments. Uh, they uh, may uh, offer their customers um, uh, services that have lower costs uh, that uh, uh, take uh, time uh, in uh, real time and they have faster accessibility. Uh, it, it helps um, uh, customers and also small and medium enterprises uh, to get access to finance. Uh, overall, uh, fintechs introduce innovative solutions and may improve uh, service availability for finance and increase competitiveness in the market. Uh, in the age of digital technologies, traditional banks need to compete with fintechs or to restructure their, uh, their business models to remain competitive in this innovative um, market. Uh, so initially, the focus of uh, fintech providers was a key service, um, uh, but uh, this trend is changing uh, in the favor of uh, big platforms of uh, big techs uh, such as Apple, Google, Amazon, uh, and so on. Uh, they have a broad international reach and they have a power and knowledge and capabilities to disrupt the financial market. Uh, Due uh, to technological advances, bargaining power, and the using of big data, the customers may get new products and services that are provided faster and easier than traditional one. And this can cause uh, some um, uh, thoughts of, of uh, financial stability, uh, especially when we are talking about crypto assets and stable coins that may be introduced by big techs. Um, uh, so if we are talking about uh, challenges and opportunities, the main opportunity is that fintechs um, is given to the financial uh, system is financial inclusion or the availability and accessibility of financial service for individuals and businesses. Uh, it's a fundamental goal of, for all uh, governments all over the world. Uh, despite the progress in uh, recent years, there are still many citizens and um, um, uh, small institutions and lack the access to basic financial services, such as uh, savings or credits. Uh, fintechs have a potential to play a major role to address this problem. Uh, due to digitalization of financial services, fintechs companies can reduce the cost of providing these services and make them available for a brighter uh, range of people. This is particularly uh, important in development countries. If we look worldwide, uh, in such regions uh, that uh, are uh, Europe and Latin America, there is a traditional financial inclusion dominates, but if we are look for uh, at Africa, or Asian countries, they maintain an overall lead in digital financial inclusions. Uh, and in some countries, uh, these fintechs may be a game changer for financial system. If you look in some African countries uh, that include uh, Zimbabwe, South Africa, and Nigeria, uh, the progress in financial inclusion in those countries is entirely driven by fintechs. And in some countries like uh, Cambodia, Ghana, or Zimbabwe, uh, they uh, mostly use uh, the mobile transactions and uh, those uh, financial services reach more than 75% of GDP. Um, if you look worldwide globally, 1.7 billion people have still no access to a bank account. And in this environment, fintechs is creating a significant opportunity. Uh, also, the uh, COVID crisis has created new opportunities for development of uh, fintech services to accelerate financial inclusions and um, 
uh, if we look uh, on some statistic of recent years, fintech uh, played an important role of mitigating the economic impact of the COVID pandemic. Um, in detail, it supports the recovery uh, and make it easier to ensure the continued access to financial services, also help to deliver government support effectively and supported consumption, uh, innovation and productivity through digital eco uh, uh, economic development. Uh, if we um, look uh, at the gender differences in the access to finance, fintech may also reduce a gender gap. Uh, if we look globally, 9% of women uh, few have access to uh, financial services compared to men. And uh, this gap is larger in development countries. Uh, for instance, in some African countries, women have 25% less access to financial services than men. Um, uh, overall, uh, the financial um, technologies um, uh, means that new players are entering the financial markets and this creates an increased need for regulation. Uh, with sufficient regulation, these improvements made by fintechs may, may uh, be very promising, but at the same time we should avoid uh, over-regulation. Uh, it may be sound easy, but uh, in the practice it's uh, not so. Uh, if we look closer to the challenges for regulation uh, that we have in regards of uh, fintechs, uh, we, we can uh, define uh, the most important of them. Uh, I just would like to uh, name some of keywords. Uh, the first keyword would be decentralized finance. Uh, decentralized finance is a broad category of financial applications that uh, use blockchain technology and its primary goal to reduce or entirely get rid of the intermediaries in involved in financial transaction. Uh, so this uh, technology is uh, not uh, so developed, but its uh, development horizon is unclear and we uh, need to regulate such a field. Uh, to get rid of uh, intermediaries, it means that uh, such technology use a network that acts as a platform and connects uh, supply and uh, demand. And uh, for these purposes, they use smart contracts that based on the computer code. Uh, the second uh, key word that I would like to mention is crypto assets, uh, especially stable coins. Uh, so as we uh, had a presentation yesterday on the uh, regulation of crypto assets in the EU, uh, micro regulation is the first worldwide that provides uh, rules uh, in this field, but other countries uh, doesn't have it. And uh, also in Europe, it will apply as 2025. Uh, the third keyword would be use of artificial intelligence. Uh, so we need to ensure that uh, the risks are understood and managed properly in this field. Uh, because uh, fintechs they provide services that uh, not only uh, financial, but some of them uh, are underlying the regulation of artificial intelligence and we should divide which service is what. Uh, and it's connected with a fourth uh, keyword, it's outsourcing. Uh, so parts of traditional value chain are migrating out of banks uh, to uh, another outsourcing companies. So these uh, transactions are divided in many steps and it's importantly to understand which steps are uh, financial services and which uh, services are uh, technology outsourcing and we need to regulate them properly. Uh, and the fifth uh, keyword uh, is uh, security uh, that includes cybersecurity, data security, and other parts of security. And this point I would like to discuss a little bit more. And I would like to say that fintechs are particularly vulnerable because the security managers uh, that they use are maybe not sufficient. If you look to the statistic 2021-2022, more than 92% of victims of cyber threats uh, were in a fintech application industry apps. 
uh, so uh, and the same we experienced also this year. Uh, the consequence of falling a victim of cybercrime are dramatic not only for customers that can lose their money, but also for fintechs themselves. The consequence can be, be a total loss of trust of customers, uh, and it can lead to loss of business. Uh, so, uh, and why are fintechs are so vulnerable. There are um, some reasons for that. The first reason is access to sensitive data. Uh, so this data includes data on financial transaction, customer, uh, client uh, payment card information, credit reports, geolocation, and some categories of uh, personal data. Uh, it's also connected with identity management because uh, financial organizations accumulate a lot of data and which creates data ownership and digital uh, identity management uh, concerns. Uh, the second reason is unproven technology. So fintechs uh, need to stay competitive and uh, provide modern services. To do they, that, they sometimes use unproven technologies. Uh, uh, they uh, uh, maybe, for example, many fintechs use mobile apps and they may use risky data storage programs. Um, so mostly uh, the banks and fintechs that use such services, they use it uh, through application programming interfaces or uh, APIs. In general, those uh, APIs are built on open source code that can be beneficial to app developers, but it also may be a quite uh, risky data storage. Um, uh, another problem is the absence of a unified app ownership. Uh, it means that there are many owners of this app. It's not only a fintech or a bank, it's also a technical provider. And they also use some outsourced services. That means that there are many uh, parties that have access to such data. Uh, so the next reason is security gaps in third party software. Uh, this also um, applies to uh, traditional banks that use some services of financial service providers and fintech startups and it uh, creates some security risks. Uh, and the last factor is also human factor. Uh, according to the statistic, human errors causes around 90% of all breaches. And this statistic is increased in the time of uh, COVID crisis and pandemic and lockdowns. That means that uh, most of employees uh, had uh, to work from home and used uh, email services, online messengers, and it uh, the means that workers become a target for potential phishing attacks. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, I would like to conclude here. Uh, so fintechs give more uh, many opportunities and chances for the future, but they create uh, many uh, challenges and um, unanswered questions. So it's a time for uh, legislator and policymakers to act and uh, to address those issues that I mentioned. And but there are also another questions that we can discuss maybe next time. <laughs> Thank you. Many thanks, Anastasia. So we keep going. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, now uh, I would like to invite uh, Stefan Schumeister to, to talk. Uh, let me introduce you. Uh, Stefan is an independent economic researcher and university lecturer at the University of Vienna. He has an extensive research experience at the Austrian Institute of Economic Research. His main fields of research are instability of financial markets and its impact on the real economy and structural changes in international trade. Christian is a colleague from the network from Edward. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, my contribution is linked in two ways uh, to the presentations by Christian and Anastasia. Uh, Christian mentioned that uh, high fossil energy prices are certainly not enough 
to succeed in the ecological transition. Why? Because other price distortions have also been tackled, and this will be the topic of my uh, presentation. And uh, my uh, the problem I will discuss is also linked to Anastasia's presentation insofar as uh, the digital revolution, so to speak, had a tremendous impact on the types and the techniques of financial speculation, also on inventing uh, new uh, instruments like uh, cryptocurrencies. However, the basic logic of financial speculation has not changed. And uh, I will try to show how the instability of exactly those prices which are most important for actors in the real economy, like exchange rates, interest rates, commodities prices, are following a sequence of what traders call bull markets, when the prices go too much up, followed by bear markets. So the issue arises, how are these wide fluctuations uh, brought about, what are the consequences for the real economy, and how could we eventually mitigate the extent of this instability. I got involved in this issue more than 40 years ago. Uh, it was the Latin American debt crisis because I could not accept the conventional explanation that those countries, they are shaped by corruption and uh, all that kind of stuff. Why could I not uh, buy this explanation? Because this was also true over the 1970s, but over the 1970s, Argentina, Mexico, Brazil were the fastest growing economies. So something different must have happened. And my explanation was uh, that over the 70s, we had two very strong depreciations of the dollars. And uh, Latin America countries took up more and more dollar credits to finance their economic growth. But then all of a sudden, when Ronald Reagan was elected president of the United States, the bear market of the dollar tilted into a bull market so that the whole amount of dollar credits was appreciated. Consequently, uh, the countries got bankrupt in 82. Uh, this then led me to the question, how can it be that the exchange rate of the most important currency, the, the key currency of the global economy, is at the same time the most unstable uh, currency out of the so-called reserve currencies? And that led me into the trading rooms of foreign exchange dealers, because economic theory didn't help me in explaining this phenomenon, so I did field research. I just went to the late 80s in trading rooms and asked foreign exchange dealers, what are you doing? I watched them, and they were very open at that time, and they showed me trading systems. They showed me, look, we have our trading system. Here we have a buy sell signal, a sell signal, and uh, we do not blindly follow these trading systems, but we use them. And I asked them, so what is the informational basis of your signals? Your past prices. And then I got a shock because the economic definition of a not even a weakly efficient market is, a market is not even weakly efficient if you can make extra profits just based on the information of past prices. So they use a technology which seems to show that the market is not even uh, weakly efficient. And uh, then I got in all this kind of stuff uh, to, uh, to check if those uh, trading systems uh, could function and under which conditions, etc. I will not talk about that. But I was also thinking about what is the relationship between the very short-term trading and the trading has become faster, faster, faster due to the digital revolution over the past decades and the phenomenon that still this long-term 
uh, cycles uh, prevail and exist. And uh, so maybe related to the fact that I like to climb up the mountains as an Austrian, I was thinking uh, you can conceive a bull market like climbing a mountain. And you never go up to a mountain in a straight line in a monotonic price path, but there are same, uh, always ups and downs, ups and downs. And then there are only two possibilities how you can overcome the difference in height. The first would be that during a bull market, the upward movements are steeper than downward movements. Then you would go like this. And this would correspond to the theory of efficient markets because only if new information hit the markets, then the price should jump up. Uh, should jump up. The other possibility is that it's only because upward runs last longer. The duration is the difference. And the result of my calculations, and they will be included in my written contribution to our uh, Jean Monnet project, uh, clearly shows for all markets, commodities, stocks, foreign exchange, it is the fact that upward movements last longer than downward movements during a bull market, and the opposite is the case during a bear market. And uh, so this was just something like a maybe too long introduction. Uh, uh, let's uh, summarize uh, the main, uh, the main uh, arguments for moving to uh, uh, electronic auctions. Asset prices move in a sequence of bull markets and bear markets. They have a very strong impact on the real economy through different channels. There are price shocks. Price shocks cause a tremendous redistribution of world income from international trade. So look at the recent oil price increase, of course, there's a tremendous redistribution in favor of oil exporting uh, countries, which dampens overall demand because as a rule, those who are the losers have to reduce their demand to a stronger or a higher extent than the winners can increase their demand. And there are in particular very important valuation effects. The valuation effects do not only uh, concern debts, but of course assets. If uh, stock prices, for example, rise tremendously due to a bull market, everybody who has a stock feels richer, but nobody gets poorer because stocks are equity. The situation is of course different, uh, different if you speak about uh, credits. Uh, Bull and bear markets are the result of the accumulation of very short-term trends across different data frequencies. This sounds a little bit difficult, but you have the statistical phenomenon of self-similarity. If I look at uh, oil futures prices based on daily data, then I look at the prices based on hourly data, then I look at the price based on five-minute data, then the basic pattern of trending and something like whipsaws. Uh, <laughs> I hope you could understand it. I, I, I never knew exactly. I, I, I didn't plan, I didn't plan that. I mean, it is a good idea, but uh, uh, I didn't plan it. So uh, I, hope, I, I never know how to, the only really way is evolution, yeah. Okay, so explain to him afterwards in the afternoon. Um, and now finally, if it is true that a bull market is just the accumulation of very short term price runs based on different data frequencies, then we would mitigate the extent of bulls and bears if you make this short-term speculation uh, more expensive or less profitable. And that basically two ideas. The one is the financial transactions tax, and I proposed the general financial transaction tax already 15 years ago. The second would be theoretically more elegant. Why? Because if we would move instead of continuous trading in microsecond, uh, microseconds to 
of, let's say, three auctions at nine o'clock, 12 and three o'clock, then we deprive the algorithm trading of their food. Their food are the prices. And if you have only three auctions a day, then you have only three prices. And there's another reason why I like this, because it is completely in line with neoclassical theory, because one of the founder, Leon Valra, always argued that auctions are the best way empirically to find what is called an uh, equilibrium price. Now, a little bit, uh, just uh, one um, differentiation. In principle, I would distinguish three channels through which uh, bulls and bears impact upon the real economy. The first is the distribution channel. If we have strong fluctuations in the dollar and commodities prices, as I mentioned, you will have distribu redistributions of trade revenues. The second is the valuation uh, channel, which refers to stocks. So we have on the one hand side wealth effects of bull markets, for example, as regards uh, uh, real estate or as regards stocks. And uh, we have to distinguish this from those asset uh, wealth effects where you have at the same time uh, liabilities. And the more general channel means that in a system where striving for profits is more and more concentrated on financial speculation, uh, activities in the real economy will be dampened through uh, many uh, causal relationships, for example, the production of insecurity, of more risk, of uh, less profitability relative to the attractiveness of short-term speculation. Now comes the empirical part. Here uh, you would see, maybe have a microphone, but you can see uh, this is the and oil. Using to get online. Yeah, you see that. Hello? 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 Oh, it's of course. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you see, this, uh, as I said, you have always this sequence of short trending. These are daily data of the oil futures price. But over a certain period of time, the upward movements last on average longer. Downward movements, this was then the oil price shock uh, after the financial crisis. Uh, uh, bull market, bear market, bull market, bear market, bull market. By the way, in my interpretation, this collapse of the oil price uh, in early 2020 was uh, the main reason why only since then, only for the last three years, OPEC and non-OPEC very closely cooperated. Before there were all this conflict, but now they understand that they only can uh, take as much profit as possible from their toxic treasures, uh, given that uh, uh, in 30, 40 years, there should not be any fossil energy bi uh, business anymore. Uh, they now try uh, the best to keep prices high. So then uh, here a little, yeah, this would just be a chart of, Data. This is also stock prices, but only on the frequency of five minute data, so much higher frequency. But the basic logic uh, applies also in this case. Uh, this would be just to remind you the tremendous dollar depreciations over the 70s, which provoked at the end of each depreciation the two oil price shocks. Because again, and this is now related to Christian's drifting problem. If the world currency is played or is at the same time the currency of the leading country, so a national currency. In other words, if the dollar serves a double role, national currency of the US and world currency, the US had a national interest to let the dollar fall because they wanted to promote their economy. But the international consequences were tremendous because as a world currency, it is the currency which is uh, which is uh, the basis for the pricing of all commodities. So, uh, for reasons, how many minutes do I have? Still not very many. Uh, here, you well known stock prices, bull market, bear market, bull market, financial crisis, bull markets. Then, 
Here, there's an episode which was co almost completely forgotten. If you take the history of stock prices, stock prices never, never, never fell so strongly than between end of February 2020 and mid of March. They fell between 30, uh, 30 35, 50, uh, 40%. In Germany, for example, stock prices fell by 35% within three weeks. And then in the uh, central banks intervened in, intervened in an incredible manner. So it's already, there's only no, two, two more things. Uh, sorry, this is here. I show you just the European carbon permit prices. And as I mentioned already yesterday, in the carbon deri derivatives markets, where we try to price carbon emissions in order to fight climate uh, uh, global heating. This instability only over the past 18 months shows that it hampers the ecological transition. Because if you would like to invest in avoiding future carbon emissions, you need to have uh, confidence in the fact that the price of emissions will steadily, not necessarily very strongly, but steadily rise so that everybody knows if I isolate my house now, over the next 30 years, I will make a profit by not paying for fossil energy. But as long as financial speculators can be active that much in the carbon market, it doesn't, uh, the system is, to my mind, not really efficient. And the conclusions, uh, I, I, I skip that. Uh, I go only to this problem, How? what can be done? What can be done to, to reduce the volatility in asset markets? One idea is the financial transaction tax. It's a very simple measure which makes any transaction just a little bit more expensive. But it would mean that even if the tax rate is 0.01%, then the complete high frequency trading would disappear, which means 70% of transactions, because high frequency trading is done at a speed where even, uh, even a, a, a smaller tax rate would make it unprofitable. The more elegant solution would be electronic options. Does this already exist? Of course. The opening price in every asset market is already nowadays determined through an auction. Because when trading starts, the computer checks how many people want to sell um, Apple shares at which price, how many want to buy them, and then it fixes the equilibrium price. So the technique is very simple. There are, of course, some more tricky issues uh, concerning uh, the difference between over-the-counter trading and trading on organized exchange, but I leave it out uh, for the moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christian. Oh, the chef. Um, now, Dimitris, you all know Dimitris, but I'm I want to make sure that you know that he's an assistant professor of international and European political economy at the National and Kapodistian University of Athens and director of the Research Center of Economic Policy, Governance and Development. He established and headed the Crisis Observatory at the Hellenic Foundation for European and Foreign Policy, Eliamet, during uh, the period 2013-19. Uh, he has served as visiting professor, the Greek National School of Public Administration and the Diplomatic Academy of the Greek Ministry of Foreign Affairs. His research focuses on international and European monetary, financial and economic governance. Dimitri, as our host, I'm very glad to pass you the <laughs> 
Thank you, Tuka. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, um, again, everybody, for being here today. Um, so I will I will take you a bit away from the more um, uh, cut, uh, cutting edge uh, type of uh, issues that uh, our previous speakers discussed about digital currencies or fintech uh, or um, moving to electronic auction systems and so on. So and I will go a bit back to more traditional issues like although they are still affected by fintech, as I will say, um, like the ones we talked about yesterday. And actually, my um, uh, my talk and, the, and my research, this is very new research, it is still in progress, so please be kind. Uh, and uh, it was inspired by, um, very recently, the you know, newspaper asked me to write a paper, an, an article about the, uh, the turbulence in the US, about the banks. And, and the, you know, the journalist said, um, and asked me a question I found interesting, whether this is once again one of the same. I mean, is there any difference why we're again, we're facing this kind of, of financial turmoil? And so I sat down and thought a bit about how different or not different is this recent episode compared to previous um, crises. So um, just as a sort of introduction, um, Does it work? Okay, thanks. Um, so the failure of the of the before U.S. middle-sized banks and the continued pressure on, on others, uh, and of course the troubles of uh, Credit Suisse challenges the adequacy of the major reform wave that started after the global financial crisis. And, and, you know, we have many, many um, recurring episodes of crisis, banking crisis in the past 40 years, particularly since the 80s, big regional crisis, but also tens, if not hundreds of individual banking crises across the world. So, you know, this, this, this question comes up, uh, why is it so difficult to prevent a banking crisis? Of course, I do not want to say that, like Professor Godjo said yesterday, and I agree with him, you cannot foresee everything, obviously, you cannot totally eclipse banking crisis, but... I think we could and should be doing a better job than we have been doing up to now. Um, and so what is the problem? Are this crisis so different than the previous crisis? So any interventions that come after one crisis is simply inadequate uh, for the next, or is it something else that is going on? Um, so first of all, banks, we, we need to keep in mind that banks are inherently vulnerable institutions, and there are a number of reasons for this. So. Fractional reserve banking um, makes them vulnerable to, to runs, to bank runs. Fractional reserve banking, for those who don't know, means that you know banks receive deposits uh, and any single day at any given day, uh, they only maintain a small part of these deposits aside to, to service uh, daily demands for withdrawals and the rest is being invested, given out as loans or in securities and so on. So if all the depositors come at the same time and ask for the money, very simply, the bank cannot uh, satisfy them. Um, and, and this is made worse by the intermediation function of the banking system, which means that they, they receive, so their, their funding is short-term short loans, effectively. Deposits are like short-term loans that depositors make to the banks. And then they give, they lend out these this deposits uh, uh, to them. They make long-term loans or buy long-term securities. So there is a maturity mismatch between their assets which have a long-term nature and the, and the liabilities, which are short-term. So therefore, when a lot of liabilities are called in in a short period of time, then they run into trouble. And of course, this also makes them very, very uh, vulnerable to interest rate risk. And we've seen this together, and I'll come back to this in the recent episodes, but also in the previous crisis, because when interest rates, uh, interest rates go uh, up uh, uh, and your previous uh, investments or loans that you got given out are in fixed lower interest rates, then you have a problem. You have to pay more for your new liabilities or your current liabilities compared to what you earned from previous um, investments. And of course, um, the change of the business model in recent decades, whereby banks do not simply now anymore take deposits and make and give out loans to businesses, but also invest and heavily involved in all kinds of uh, investing um, uh, operations, and make them more vulnerable to more different types of market risk. Um, and, and finally, of course, they are very vulnerable to systemic shocks or, um, or, or downturns, for example, a recession, 
means that uh, banks may face credit risk because they give out loans. So if households or businesses cannot repay their, their loans, then obviously the banks are also going to have um, a problem. So um, banking crisis is coming in different forms and shapes. Um, uh, and the problem is that despite the differences between them, because of the, the central position of, of the banking system, modern capitalism, um, these crises, however different, they all have the capacity to create major disturbance in the economy and all, can all actually develop into systemic crises. So I, I will try to compare a bit the recent turmoil of the global financial crisis and the SNL price, the savings and loan price, uh, crisis in the United States and the US, which are some of the two biggest, perhaps, uh, recent uh, banking crises. Um, and, and you have different types in, in every single one actually encompasses different types of crisis. So you have, let's say more generally three types of, of, of crisis, uh, in, in a sense, uh, too big to fail. So you have very big institutions that you cannot afford to, 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 to let them collapse because the, the spillover effects for the economy would be huge. You have two inter interconnected to fail, uh, which means that the institutions may not be that large, but they are too interconnected particularly globally, and if this was the case, for example, with Lehman Brothers and Bernstein's, Stens, they weren't huge institutions. Actually, in the ranking of U.S. institutions, they were pretty much in the same place as Silicon Valley Bank or First Republic that collapsed a few weeks ago. So, But it was their interconnection to the global economy that was the case. Uh, and um, I mean, I, if, if you read, for example, Timothy Geithner's book, who was uh, president of the Federal Reserve of New York at the time and handled the crisis and then uh, Treasury of the Secretary, um, Secretary of the Treasury, uh, he said that the problem was exactly that. They, they had um, counted about thousands of institutional counterpart investors across the globe and they did not know where to begin and what starts addressing the, the, the problems. Uh, so they're not huge, but they were turned and connected. And of course, new technologies made this interconnection even, even uh, broader and faster. And of course, there's another type of crisis, too many to fail. So here you have small and medium-sized banks, which are large in number, uh, not big banks or interconnected necessarily, but they all expose the similar kind of asset class. So when you, there is a problem, many banks fail together. And this can, of course, also turn into a systemic crisis. So um, the, uh, the, um, the global financial crisis had all three elements. It had too big to fail banks like Citibank or other institutions like AIG, the, the, the huge insurance corporation uh, in the US. It had an interconnected uh, aspect, like as just I said, like with Lehman Brothers or Baron Stearns. And also it had too many to fail. Many people do not know that, but actually gradually the crisis developed into a too many to fail um, crisis uh, after 2009, 2010, the peak of the crisis, and until 2012, 13, there were more than 500 small and middle-sized banks in the U.S. that collapsed. Um, most of them, so-called community banks. So um, you had all three aspects in the, in the global financial crisis. Uh, in the savings and loan crisis, it was mainly uh, too many to fail type of crisis, and the and the recent financial uh, turmoil uh, was. Um, uh, both had to big to fail, uh, had a both big to fail asset with credit trees. Uh, but in the US, it was mostly too many to fail uh, kind of, of crisis. However, despite these different aspects that every crisis and the crisis between them had, I, I would like to argue that they have certain common features. So the first common uh, feature between these three crises is the swift change in the in the in the environment and particularly in the in the increase in interest rates. This happened in all three cases. So you see there. Um, uh, this is a bit of theoretical like background. What happens when you have a rapid rise and significant rise in interest rates? So on the asset side, you have income losses because you need to pay higher deposit rates and more generally higher rates to um, to borrow money. Uh, and this is particularly problematic that the losses are, are higher when you have already, as I said before, given out loans with higher and fixed rates, with lower, sorry, and fixed rates, as was the case, for example, in the savings and loans crisis. A second effect is that you, uh, the loss of asset value, and this is what happened to the um, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, for example, you, you have issued before securities or given out loans um, at a specific um, uh, level of returns. Now the interest rates rise, so the returns, the new securities uh, are, are worth more than the older securities that you hold in your portfolio, and therefore you have 
so-called unrealized losses. Okay, so your your assets are, are worth less now. Um, this is not necessarily a problem until the, the time you need to to sell some of them. Then you have to realize the loss. This is what happened with Silicon Valley Bank. They had to cover, for example, uh, other losses or withdrawals from deposits, and they had to sell some of their securities, earlier securities, and they did so at a big loss. Uh, and of course, you also have increased credit risk because when interest rates rise, we saw that, for example, in Greece, they started as a fiscal or a sovereign debt crisis, and then the economy went into a huge recession. And when we have a, a huge recession, um, you have a lot of, of, of non-performing loans, the issue we were discussing yesterday, red loans. The, the same can happen when you have an increase in interest rates. This happened in the national crisis. This is um this may happen again this happened in the global financial crisis i mean the global financial crisis started in the subprime mortgage market in the us when the fed started increasing interest rates again after it had reduced it to very very low levels uh following the 11 september uh, attack um now on the liability side you have deposit withdrawals because depositors uh, try to find um uh, you know more attractive um uh, placements for example banks like uh, in, uh, silicon valley uh, bank lost out depositors to money market funds this is exactly the same thing that happened uh, back in the 80s um savings and loan institutions were losing depositors to money market funds uh, so uh, this is a, a big problem and of course increased cost of short-term wholesale funding as interest rates rise, again, you need to pay more to get uh, to have access to short-term funding. Um, so um, a second common feature is overwhelming exposure to, uh, to particular market segments. So both the SNL crisis and the global financial crisis, there was huge exposure to the housing market in particular, and also to real to commercial real estate. Well, in the SNL crisis, this happened afterwards. In, in, the, in the first instance, this was a crisis of the housing market. Well, they had problems because they were exposed to the housing market um, and had given out long-term fixed rate mortgages. But then there was deregulation. I'll come back to that in a moment. And they were allowed to invest in real, in commercial real estate, these, these institutions. And then they all went and, and invest in commercial real estate, along with many other banks, traditional commercial banks in the U.S., and all of them collapsed when the bubble a few years later uh, broke. Actually, we had between 1918 and 1994, we had 1,600 banks uh, closing down in the US. This is beside the SNL institutions. So you had thousands of banks in the space of 15, and by other banking institutions, space of 15 years uh, closing down. Um, and, and of course, being being uh, having a lot of exposure to a particular sector, particularly in the housing market, makes you very valuable to interest rate uh, increases. Whereas uh, the the 2003 technology, there was a lot of for these regional U.S. banks, a lot of exposure to um, the technology startups, the Silicon Valley community, if you like, uh, and the venture capitalists. So again. Uh, when the interest rates went up, what happened? Because these were unsecured deposits. They, these are big clients, and their deposits are way above uh, what is secured by the government. So they started, again, leaving and um, uh, going elsewhere for money market funds, for example, to find a better, a better um, uh, returns. Or when trouble was uh, apparent, they simply fled to go to more secure um, uh, places. And you see here, this is um, some data from, this is from the latest IMF Global Financial Stability Report. And you see here that a lot of banks' funding comes from securities and particularly debt securities, which are more vulnerable to, to uh, increase a change in the interest rate environment. Uh, you see that US banks are hold the, the, the high, and Latin American banks, by the way, as well, <laughs> have the higher levels of uh, debt securities in their portfolios. And also this is the estimated impact to, um, to the capital of banks from unrealized losses, the thing that I spoke about before. Um, and, and you see here, these are, that can be quite significant, even if, it, if we take the median, which means you take all the banks that have some losses and you take uh, you know, the, the middle price, let's say the middle um, uh, price of the, of the losses. And you see that for, for the U.S. banks, this is quite substantial, close to 300% uh, basis points. So close to three to three uh, percentage points. 
Um, but what is interesting is the fifth percentile. Some people will say, okay, this is a small part, but you know, this is this is the part of the banks that have big losses. But again, even if it's only five percent of them, you, you see there's a huge exposure and huge impact in their capital. So you don't need need everybody to go to have trouble and go bankrupt. It can start with a few banks that have big exposures and big impacts in their capital base. So that 5% can be more than enough to kickstart uh, uh, broader problems. And of course, the regulation. The regulation for me is, is, is crucial. It's, it's quite interesting. In, in all three cases, there was the regulation before the crisis, which made the crisis more likely. In the SNL crisis, you have an added aspect that you have deregulation as a solution to the crisis. So what happened in the savings and loans crisis back in the 80s is that in the 70s, there was um, a deregulation to introduce more competition. So you have the creation of effectively, effectively of institutional investors in the 70s, things like mutual market funds, fi um, fixed income funds, uh, uh, pension funds entering the market and so on. So all these institutional investors uh, were able to start competing with banks because of the regulation. And this, when the crisis started, created pressure because the banks, the SNLs, could not compete with these uh, vehicles, with these other institutions. And so, therefore, the U.S. authorities said, okay, you have problems because you cannot compete with them, so we'll deregulate even further, so now you can do whatever they can do, and we, we, we uh, relax our requirements. So there were caps on deposits that were relaxed, um, they were in the minimum standards for establishing new SNLs were substantially relaxed. Capital requirements were reduced. Deposit insurance was expanded, um, and accounting rules were were changed to 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 make it appear that institutions were credit worthy and and safe, whereas they were not. Um, so this made the crisis even worse, actually. And then we had the, the in the second wave because all these all these institutions expanded to new markets like the commercial. Uh, real estate market, as I said before, uh, they overextended themselves. They were already very weak, and then when that bubble as well collapsed, they all collapsed altogether. So actually, that made the crisis even even bigger. And of course, there's don't have to say much about the global financial crisis. We know that the deregulatory uh, wave continued in the '90s and 2000s uh, in the U.S. and globally. So functional limitations, geographical limitations, all sorts of limitations were re uh, removed, and therefore you had increased competition, um, which led to many of them uh, in, in you know in equilibria and um, excess uh, behaviors, uh, excessive behaviors that were so that led up to the crisis. And then in 2023, uh, turmoil, um, we st also we had a, a deregulation um, uh, episode after the global financial crisis. We had the Dodd-Frank Act in the US, a huge reform package that addressed a lot of issues, not all of the issues, but a lot of issues. This was watered down in 2018, and particularly the, the, the deregulation that was, um, uh, you know, pushed forward at the time, um, you know, concerned particularly middle-sized, smaller and middle-sized banks, exactly like the banks that were facing all the problems uh, in, in recent weeks and months. So, in all three cases, we have this common denominator that the environment was deregulated and many of the uh, um, limitations were relaxed beforehand. So, for me, this is just a, a very broad... Um, schematic there are two broad if you like structural common causes you have what we call financial liberalization which has at least two basic aspects liberalization of the capital flows and deregulation of the financial system which is a bit of a different thing it means that you deregulate the way the financial system operates you open up to competition foreign uh, entities can come in the market and compete with local entities and so on so all this stuff will have led to increased competition so we have a very, very competitive financial environment. The problem with the financial industry is that it is different to the more traditional product industries. So um, competition can be very risky, actually, in the financial industry. Uh, whereas, for example, in a, in a, in a product uh, market, you would expect companies in order to compete effectively to deal with increased competition, to try to become more efficient, to reduce the cost of production, and therefore have a higher margins, either compete and outcompete other competitors or have higher profit margins for themselves. Increased competition in the financial market means assumption of increased risk. I mean, uh, uh, companies, financial companies and banks become more willing to assume more risks and invest in more risky assets. 
And this is, has gone hand in hand with the change in the business model in recent decades where we've changed to a shareholder kind of, of model for the banks when they try to sell more and more securities. So again, they have walked away from the more traditional um, get deposit, give out loans kind of, of, uh, of model. And, and, and so we have skewed incentives uh, and this um, becomes even uh, worse because when you take into account more hazard because they know that the state will step in when there's trouble uh, for the and these risky assets uh, uh, turn sour. In addition, you have that board, the so-called border problems. So if you try to regulate more the banks, as this was the case after the global financial crisis, what happens is that um, the, the business for the shadow banking system increases. So you have uh, other entities and other uh, areas of finance which are not regulated as strictly as banks, and then business simply moves to the more unregulated part of the market. And because now finance is globalized as well, you also have a, a border problem uh, with relation to other jurisdictions. Even if the US or the EU increase as they have increased their, their the level of the regulation, then business also can move to Asia, for example. And it has moved following the global financial crisis. Uh, the stock exchanges in Asia uh, and more, more generally uh, organized exchanges have seen a growth in their business of over 60%. So a lot of the business is moving to unregulated areas, um, either functional regulated areas or geographical unregulated areas. So this is a big, uh, a big issue. And this is why financial stability is, we should be treated as a global common good. You know, we all need to cooperate in order to address it. And in my view, this very competitive environment creates endogenously um, an unstable situation because then it gives incentives to the managers, the bank managers, to push on supervisor and regulatory authorities to deregulate more for them to be able to compete and for the supervisors to be more relaxed to take, uh, to adopt a regulatory forbearance stand. Uh, stands again to like turn a blind eye so they can uh, assume more risky uh, operations. And we have seen that repeatedly happening. For example, the, 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 the abolition of the Glass-Steagall Act was because US banks wanted to compete on more equal footing with the European banks. Um, the lacks of supervision widely acknowledged by um, Greenspan, the president of the Fed himself, uh, was part of this uh, economic philosophy, like the market will take care of itself. So, and actually in Basel, in Basel two and then three, uh, um, financial discipline is one of the pillars of supervision. So the market is supposed to take care of itself to some extent. Uh, this is true and it can happen, but you can not really over rely on that. You need more um, uh, more regulation. And as Professor Gozzi was saying yesterday, more far more strict supervision. Um, so this is uh, the, just to give you an extent of this, this competition between the, the official, if you like, banking system and the, the, the shadow banking system. This is from the Financial Stability Board, some data. And you see that the red bars are the banks and the gray, the gray um, part of the bars on top are the other financial institutions, so various shadow banking institutions. And you see that already they account for one third of all assets globally. So one, one third of the system is other financial institutions and this other can be many many different things um and, and in, actually this is a breakdown of what this other means for example the red bars ef1 are are as defined by the fsb itself it says they know i will read the notes because they're tiny there um this is um management of collective investment vehicles susceptible to runs so the big bar, the red one, is like money market funds, the fixed exchange funds, and they are susceptible to runs, just like traditional banks. The uh, EF2 is um, lending depending on short-term funding, uh, for example, uh, broker dealers. So these are institutions that give out loans, but they depend on giving out these loans on short-term funding on the wholesale markets. EF3 similarly is uh, market intermediation uh, institutions that again rely on certain funding. So you have all these institutions that sell a lot of the characteristics of the functions that banks do, the intermediation function and the vulnerabilities that go with these functions that banks have as well. The, the runs, the intermediation, the maturity mismatch risk I, I described earlier, but they are not regulated as the banks. So this is, this is, a, big, this is a big problem. 
Uh, and you see not only that, but also there's a close connection between the banking system and these institutions. I mean, some of these institutions may be subsidiaries of, of you know, in banking groups. So you see this in, uh, increasingly, the, um, this is the bank's cross-border linkages. So this is the percentage uh, of total cross-border claims and liabilities. And you see uh, between banks and these kinds of institutions, it goes up and up since only in recent years from uh, like 15% up to, to more than 20%, both liabilities and claims. So there's a big interconnection between the official and the shadow banking um, uh, system, and this makes it more, the whole system more viable. So I'm, I'm running out of time. Um, the problem, I will not go if, if you like and discuss some of these things later in the discussion. The problem therefore is that all these vulnerabilities make the resolution of banks when they get into trouble non-credible. We saw that in the recent episode. Credit Suisse had to be, um, well, they, they found, a, let's say, private market uh, solutions. Another bank bought it, but the state had to intervene, give out guarantees, cover losses, and, and so on. So, and give out also a, a big liability um, uh, fund. And the same happened in the US. So, we have not avoided, and this is despite all the bail-in and other resolution mechanisms put in place after the global financial crisis. So when actually the crisis hits, most resolution mechanisms tend to be non-credible, including bail-in. In Italy, we had a huge crisis in 2015, 16, 17. They bailed them out because the people that would lose the money were pensioners. It's it's easy like in Cyprus to bail, you know, to bail in Russian oligarchs. But it's when it's like pensioners or, you know, everyday people, your own citizens vote for you, by the way, then it's much more difficult to impose losses on them. Politically, there are big uh, constraints there. So in conclusion, the reforms from Bill's banking uh, crisis have repeatedly failed to prevent new crises. Uh, although one has to admit the system is more resilient now, definitely in the banks are more resilient. And we saw that, for example, through the pandemic, um, we have various incremental and technical solutions that are being proposed, but they have many limitations, both technical and political. Um, and in my view, we have to move, again, there was a discussion about it yesterday, to more radical solutions like narrow banking, breaking up to big federal institutions, factual ring fencing. Actually, the UK has moved to ring fencing, retail banking from investment activities already from 2019. I don't see them suffering any you know, fun fundamental um, uh, problems or big losses in their in the financial industry. So unfortunately, such proposals were not really considered after the global financial crisis. Um, and authorities opted for enhanced resolution schemes, which, however, as I said, face significant obstacles once a crisis actually erupts. So I think we are stuck with recurring episodes of banking crisis for now and the foreseeable future. Um, and um, I'll stop here with this rather pessimistic note. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Now we are open for discussions, questions. Yes, please. Uh, let's pick three and then three more. Uh, first off, thank all three of you for your wonderful speeches. Uh, I would like to direct my question to Dr. Kodovskaya. Uh, I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Uh, so you touched two topics that I find very interesting. Uh, so from the one, on the one hand, we have fintech, uh, blockchain, all this financial technology. Um, and on the other hand, we have Africa. So uh, something which I find very interesting is that currently around one third of the world does not have access to the internet at all, uh, with the majority of these people being based in Africa right now. So in the foreseeable future, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not in a year, but in 10 years, in 15 years, uh, there are already many, many, many different approaches that are trying to give those people internet access. So if we assume that in 10 years from now, that one third has access to the internet, which is around 2 billion people. There's going to be a digital revolution, a new digital revolution based in Africa. And uh, from what I've seen, for example, we have the Cardano project and many projects are trying to establish themselves in Africa in blockchain, in fintech. 
when all these 2 billion people become active consumers, everyday consumers of these financial products, and they start to build their own startups, their own fintech solutions, those solutions will not, will not only be targeting the African demographic, but the entire world. But because of their lack at this point of technological innovation, because of the uh, lack in internet access in many places, there is no correct, correct, proper legal framework, security-wise, most importantly, a legal framework to protect data, like you said, uh, protect uh, the data of consumers, the way they're stored, the way they're transferred, etc. So how do you think this will play out when this revolution takes place? Revolution, quote unquote. Uh, how will we be able to keep up these people will be keep up with the security issues that are arising and affect the entirety of the world because we're going to be using their services, which may be insecure. So how do you think this will play out as a whole?
uh, all the three presentations quite uh, interesting, insightful. Um, first to Anastasia, I would be tempted to talk about financial inclusion and new technology and developing world. That's a long topic. I think we have to be careful here because we, when we talk about financial inclusion in countries like Africa, we're talking about very poor people. And then all kinds of issues arise. And um, financial access is a very multifaceted also um, uh, issue. If you give access to just, just transfer money or if you get access to save or to financial products, these are different worlds. Um, and one has to be very careful to assess each by each and then add the additional dimension of uh, new tech, which is really a complex world, but I always find it helpful to, um, to, to, to retranslate it to the conventional financial market uh, distinctions. Okay, so that only as a comment. Um, uh, no, the second also is, is a comment and a question. You said that regulation um, is a challenge in this area, of course, because among others, because there's a high level of outsourcing and subdivision of different steps. And it's difficult to distinguish, or to distinguish which is financial services, which is not financial services. This speaks to a more general problem that here in this new tech, fintech uh, uh, air, um, 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 context, the information asymmetries between regulators and people in the market are very big. And regulators are running very much behind and fintech people always tell them that this is very complicated technology, you will not understand. And I think if you make regulators dependent on understanding the technology and on that basis distinguishing which is what, regulators get lost. So I would argue in the sense of, 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 of symmetry that also in this area, regulation should be more comprehensive and more general and not try to be so specific that it's always running behind. Um, to Dimitris, I very much, I, I like your approach where you end. I first like your distinction of the three criteria of, 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 of banking crisis. It helps to, to understand and it helps to understand how you come to the conclusion of um, a more radical regulation. My question would be, what would the panelists of yesterday answer to your uh, uh, request? I'm with you, but what do you imagine the others would respond? Then finally to Stefan, um, I, I, I find this in, interesting insight to look into the effects of short-term trading on longer-term trading. The question, my question is if things really change so much and if we do really go out of boom-bust cycles, if you change from very short-time microseconds trading to an auctioning, let's say three times, times a day, what would have changed in the past crisis? Um, aren't these cycles which by auctioning three times a day still would happen this way? So I think I can start because the first question was for me. Uh, so the first question was, um, about um, financial inclusion in Africa. So you asked uh, what I expect will be with the African market in 10 years. So I really hope that those people will become the access. Uh, so, but I'm, uh, I would not say that it takes only 10 years to make Africa financial accessible. I would expect that it takes more time. Um, so if you talk about uh, that data privacy issues, I think the African market is a uh, very big different uh, when we are uh, um, 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 uh, you think that uh, um, I, I would say that it's completely different from the uh, European market. Uh, is, uh, as Barbara mentioned, uh, there are people that are very poor, so they have no savings. If they have access to um, send the money to other people in other African countries, they would be happy to do this. Of course, uh, the legal framework is still missing there, but uh, uh, there is nothing to 
regulates there. It takes time. I hope that uh, African countries would follow uh, the best practices uh, that uh, they can uh, see in Europe or in North uh, America and in other uh, countries that hey develop uh, financial markets and fintechs. And uh, I don't expect that Europeans will use European uh, will use African services that cannot prove the data security, the cyber security. Uh, so I don't see here the risk for European markets or American markets or Latin American markets. So I I, I just can hope that Euro uh, that African market will develop. Uh, and uh, if they can uh, offer the services that uh, as uh, stable, that can uh, be secure in terms of data security, in terms of cyber security, then uh, the rest of the world will be happy to use it. But it take, uh, uh, when we are speaking from today, it take many time to uh, reach this state. Um, so would you like to answer another question? Christian, do you would like to go a bit? Do you like to go? Only I would ask a bit briefly because we are uh, okay. supposed to, to to finish. I mean, because that's not an event in a few uh, in a few minutes. So. Yes, okay. I just uh, would like to answer Barbara's question. What would be what would have been different uh, in case that, for example, financial transaction stacks or electronic auctions? Uh, would have um, substituted continuous trading. Uh, in general, it is clear my proposals are extremely modest. To my mind, uh, a capitalist system where it is possible to systematically make profits through activities which are unrelated to the real economy, such a system always has destroyed itself from the Dutch republics in the 18th, in the 17th centuries, uh, to my mind, to the U.S. system since the 1970s. Uh, it is so simple because, uh, as Keynes said, if you allow to make money out of nothing, then you produce a systemic disincentive for entrepreneurship. I mean, uh, the role of banks has to be the role of servants, purely servants. If we would uh, focus as bankers uh, only on financing investment, financing uh, international trade and all other real uh, world activities, we would never have balance sheet sums of 400, 500% of GDP. That all is crazy, but it is just a symptom of a multi-dimensional crisis, which will uh, come to an end. Uh, but the way could be very hard, and that is the reason why I'm still, at the same time, an evolutionary economist. So my very modest proposals try to, to reach people which do not want to change, to, to get rid of capitalism. I don't want to get rid of capitalism. I'm old, I lived in the 50s and 60s, and I know you can not tame capitalism, but you can restrict the, the potential of activities within a capitalistic system so that it works pretty well. For example, 50s, 60s, no financial crisis, no banking crisis. Why? Because we didn't regulate financial markets. We just shut them. There was no foreign exchange market. Full stop. We do not need, it is ridiculous to trade the price of crude oil and gas and uh, coal, the main uh, causes for climate change on free derivatives markets where you have these kind of fluctuations. That is just bullshit. It does not work. And the only thing I can advise also young people, read old master John Maynard Keynes, but in the original. He has so wonderful, concrete uh, proposals, not in the textbooks, this is a horror. But the original is really, you can learn a lot from that. Even uh, only one chapter, chapter 12, you can download it from the internet of the general theory. It is a description of what's going on in our world over the past 40 years. And it 
is absolutely unfortunate. Full stop. <laughs> Thank you, um, uh, Stefan. Very, very briefly, um, um, what yesterday's people would say, uh, yes, well, some of our uh, distinguished guests yesterday were, um, were are part of the policy-making regulatory uh, community, so they are in the system, and it's perhaps very difficult for them to, you know, fathom and or, or consider more radical um, uh, changes, although, as I said, it's not that radical. I mean, the UK already is is, is implementing one of these proposals. So, and I'll, actually, as the, the Lincoln Committee was mentioned yesterday, these are former policy makers. Perhaps, the, you know, the, um, the word former is crucial here because it liberates people. But anyhow, our job as academics is to push the envelope and propose, you know, a bit more ambitious stuff that, um, again, I would agree with Stefan within not trying to create a revolution of any, any type, but making simply making the system work more effectively um, uh, with more uh, efficiency, more stability, uh, primarily. Uh, so I would probably not convince them. <laughs> That's the, the end result. Uh, digital risks are, are many. I, I think I agree with you. Digital um, financial inclusion should go hand in hand, uh, one of the risks with digital skills, because you know, if you open up the box and people in Africa, you know, simply get some chances, but not not really are, are skilled or have education in, in, in that literacy. It's the literacy, they can, we can have bigger problems. Um, there is a, an issue with fragmentation. Blockchain is by definition, a, 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 you know, decentralized technology. So there are many problems there on how to regulate it effectively the the, the apps the different many different apps the, the internet community uh, you know operates like that it's by definition all, also decentralized so how to regulate such a the regular the decentralized communities is, is without stifling its innovation is very very complicated issue um and about global cooperation, I think we should move. I don't know about the Like I think this is should be tackled in a G20 kind of in Basel committee with G20 enhanced membership. Uh, I think a forum like this should take the lead, and then this could be you know translated in more concrete proposals in in bilateral in the regional uh, kind of negotiations. But I think this should be a global um, initiative. Very pleased with that because we are pressed for time. Thank you. If you allow me to, thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> for coming.